Welcome to Learning Thursdays. I'm Dean Hale with the OASIS Learning and Development Unit and your host for today's presentation. Today's presentation is titled The Science of Cannabis, and our presenter is Dr. Grace Hennessy, Associate Chief Medical Officer, Addiction Psychiatry for New York State OASIS. She'll be joining us in just a moment. First, a word about Learning Thursdays. Learning Thursdays are offered to behavioral health professionals as a free learning opportunity with the goal of improving the knowledge and skills of the New York State Substance Use Disorder workforce as we strive to improve the lives of individuals needing prevention, treatment, and recovery services. A goal of Learning Thursdays is to support the professional development of the treatment, prevention, and recovery workforce. We do this by offering regular presentations that are relevant to today's substance use disorder treatment professional. As always, if there are any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to contact us at the Learning Thursdays mailbox. You can use the same mailbox to express an interest in providing a future Learning Thursdays program. And now, it's time to start the presentation and welcome our presenter. Thank you, Dean. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Grace Hennessy from OASIS, and today, as Dean said, I'll be speaking about the science of cannabis. Our overview for today is I'm going to review cannabis, cannabis plant preparations and synthetic cannabinoids, endocannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors, THC, CBD, and synthetic cannabinoid pharmacology, the effects of cannabis on the brain, including psychiatric conditions, the effects of cannabis on the lungs, cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal systems, and cannabis in pregnancy. Our learning objectives today are to gain a better understanding of the cannabis plant, describe the effects of THC, CBD, and synthetic cannabinoids on the mind and body, describe the criteria for cannabis use disorder and cannabis withdrawal, gain a better understanding of the relationship between cannabis use and psychiatric disorders, describe medical conditions that may occur because of cannabis use, and describe the possible effects of cannabis on pregnancy. Cannabis co it comes from the genus of the flowering plants in the Cannabisae family. And there are two main species, Cannabis sativa and Cannabis indica. The cannabis plant synthesizes more than 500 compounds and about 120 phytocannabinoids or plant cannabinoids have been identified. The two that we speak about the most are Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or Delta-9 THC or just plain THC which is the major psychoactive compound of cannabis, and cannabidiol, or CBD, which is a non-intoxicating component of the plant. Cannabis strains are often described by their THC to CBD ratio. There are other cannabinoids in the plant that are of note. Cannabivarin, or CBDV, has no psychoactive properties, but it is being investigated as an anti-seizure medication. Cannabigerol, or CBG, has been shown in animal models to suppress nausea and vomiting, and it may also reduce inflammation and stimulate appetite. So it is another compound of interest, for, perhaps for medications. Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, or Delta-8 THC, is 20% less active than Delta-9. I'm going to have another slide about that in a few minutes, so I'm not going to say more now. And then there's tetrahydrocannabivarin or THCV, which is an interesting compound because it can be used and it has been used in research studies to distinguish uh, THC that came from um, using, using cannabis or THC that came from medications. The terrapenes are the largest group of phytochemicals and they are the chemicals that give cannabis that distinctive smell. So they're the main aromatic compounds and they reflect the immediate environment and growing conditions. Flavonoids are found in many fruits, vegetables, and grains and they have antioxidative and anti-inflammatory effects and omega fatty acids you may have heard of and they're very good they're the good fatty acids that are protective for heart health and other, um, and other organ systems. Hemp is a variety of the cannabis sativa plant that is low in THC, but it then has a higher cannabidiol content instead. 
and the fibers, seeds, and flowers use, are used to make a variety of products. So food, cosmetics, textiles, and fabrics. Hemp for a long time was actually illegal. All varieties of the cannabis plant, again, including hemp, were made illegal under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. The Food and Drug Administration also made all varieties of the cannabis plant a Schedule One substance. And what a Schedule One substance is, is a substance that has no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Cannabis remains a Schedule One substance. That may change in time, but for now, it still is a Schedule One. In 2014, the Agricultural Act distinguished between hemp and marijuana legally for the first time. And that allowed for the study of hemp and some limited cultivation to be used for products as mentioned above. The 2018 Farm Bill actually removed hemp from the Schedule I group of cannabis plants. And, um, but it has sp special definitions now. So to come off the Schedule One list and to not be in the Controlled Substance Act, it requires that hemp has to be less than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis. That's a very low percentage of THC. And hemp is now considered to be like any other agri agricultural product, like other plants, fruits, and so on. Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, to go back to that for a minute, is actually naturally low in concentration in the cannabis plant. And it comes mostly from the chemical synthesis um, of CB CBD derived from, from hemp. So apologies, it is chemically synthesized from CBD derived from the hemp plant. Synthetic Delta HTHC has been added to edible plant and inhaled products, and they've been marketed as quote, legal hemp products. The, it's an isomer of delta-9 THC with a lower affinity for cannabinoid receptors. So it does have a lower potency than delta-9 THC, and it's estimated at about 50 to 70 percent. Delta-8 THC, though, was added as a Schedule One substance in 2020 by the DEA. So it is, again, Schedule One. It's, it's considered not to have any medicinal purposes and to um, have a high potential of abuse. And in the New York State regulations, they were recently amended to prohibit the use of Delta HTHC created when processing cannabinoid hemp products. This slide just shows that they're the difference between the two. So on the left is Delta 9 THC, on the right is Delta HTHC, and you can just see there's a shift of the chemical bond from one place to another where the arrow is, is pointed, and that's what makes it an isomer. So it's a related compound, but it's not exactly the same. But again, it does have psychoactive properties, and it is something that, uh, that, that the government does want to regulate. In terms of cannabis plant preparations, the one the most commonly known by everyone is marijuana. And marijuana, by definition, is the dried flowering tops and leaves of the cannabis plant. THC concentrations determine the potency of the marijuana. So the flowers have the most THC, which is greater than the THC in the upper leaves, which is greater than the lower leaves. And then the stems and then the seeds have the lowest concentrations of THC. CBD is also present in marijuana, but it's in lower concentrations. Marijuana is smoked, vaped, and consumed in beverages and food, known as edibles. And sensimilla is a particular type of a marijuana product that is very high potency. Sensimilla is the Spanish word for without seeds. And how that happens is that the growers prevent the female plant's flowers from coming into contact with flowers from a male plant. So basically the plant doesn't get pollinized. It doesn't make baby plants, so to speak. So if the plant is not taken up, the female plant is not taken up in creating more plants, it can create more cannabinoids. So it's a higher concentration of cannabinoids in, in sensimilla. This slide shows a graph uh, noting the changes over time in THC and CBD content in cannabis samples seized by the DEA. So the DEA seizes all types of cannabis samples. So some of them are plant, some of them are hemp, some of them are, are resin products, um, hashish, and they send them to a lab and they have them tested to see what the THC and CBD content is. And if you look, if you start over here, we start at 1995, 
Um, it might be a little bit hard to see on the slide, but the red line is the percentage of THC. The blue line is the percentage of, T of CBD. And as you can see over time, actually back in 1995, it's a little confusing because the THC is higher. Um, the percent THC is on the left side. The percentage of CBD is on the right side. And while it is higher than the CBD percentage, it is lower than what we see today. So if you follow along the red line, you can see we've gone down from about 4% um, THC in cannabis samples seized by the DEA to 15% in about 2018 and a little decrease down to 14.35% in 2019. CBD has actually gone sort of a bit the other way. It had increased for a while, but you can see this crossover point in 2006 where the, C, where the THC percentage starts to be much, much greater than the CBD percentage. It decreases then it goes up again and it's, it's, it's hovering around 0.24%. So over time it went up and down. It's fairly similar to what it was in 1995, but you can see there is a very, very big difference between the percentage of THC in cannabis samples these days to the percentage of CBD. Another plant preparation from, from cannabis are extracts. Extract is any cannabis compound and obtained through an extraction process. The extracts have the highest concentrations of cannabinoids. Hemp extracts have higher CBD concentrations, which would make sense because the hemp plant has lower THC concentrations. And extracts from marijuana have higher THC concentrations. Hashish or hash is the dried resin of the cannabis sativa flowers. And hash or hashish comes from mechanically pressing or by ice water extraction of the resin and then it's dried. Solvents now are used to remove compounds from the plant. Different types of solvents like ethanol, carbon dioxide, butane, and others. And those extracts are called dabs. So when chemicals are used, the extracts that, that come from them are called dabs. And these are incredibly high concentrations of cannabinoids. So they can be up to 90% cannabinoids. It can either be C THC or CBD. Some common slang names you'll see online for um, THC containing dabs include shatter, wax, honeycomb, and butane hash oil, or BHO. Dabbing is the process of flash vap vaporizing an ex extract for high intensity consumption. There's a whole bunch of special equipment that goes along with it. There's a dabbing nail, which is a quartz, titanium, or ceramic surface heated to vaporize a dab. A dabber is a metal or glass instrument to apply a dab to a nail. A dab ring is a special water pipe with a fitting for the nail. And there are specialized blow torches used to heat the nail that are available in different sizes. So a dab placed on the heated nail with a dabber and the vapor then passes through the dab ring and it's inhaled. You get a much more intense psychological and physical effects this way. But the other problem is you get the residual solvents, pesticides, and other byproducts from the cannabis plant, but also from the chemicals used to extract the cannabinoids, as we mentioned before. So things like ethanol, butane, and so forth. One of the concerns that's come up with dabbing is an increase in emergency department visits for flash burns over the past 10 years. These increases has been seen primarily in California and Colorado who have who legalized cannabis many years before states like New York. And what, what it seemed to happen, seemed to come from was individuals extracting THC from marijuana on their own using butane. They were doing it in their homes and in non-commercial spaces. And butane is quite flammable. So it's, it's highly flammable. The fumes accumulate in the air. And then they're easily ignited by static electricity or any kind of flame source. So people were burning themselves as they were trying to make their own dabs. Um, commercial production of dabs. There are companies out there that make dabs. On, you can find them online. It is safer, but it's more expensive. So online commercial, commercially produced BHO can cost anywhere from $80 to $800, depending on the THC concentration, the preparation. Whereas buying cannabis or buying marijuana is more like a $100 to $200 range. So individuals are probably trying to make their own BHO, their own butane hash oil at home. But again, this has been a consequence of it um, where people have had severe burns in trying to do this. 
And there are actually cannabinoid medications. There is pharmaceutical grade synthetic cannabinoids. There are FDA approved synthetic cannabinoid THC analogs, and that's dronabinol that goes by the brand names Marinol and Syndros. Marinol is a pill. Syndros is a, an oral solution. And it is those dronabinol is indicated for nausea associated with, with cancer chemotherapy that's not treatable with traditional anti-nausea medications. So people undergoing chemotherapy have terrible nausea. If they have tried everything and nothing has worked to control the nausea, dronabinol can be prescribed. It's also indicated for anorexia or loss of appetite associated with weight loss in AIDS. So it, it's used to increase people's appetite, but it is in for people who, who have AIDS. Navalone is the other medication. Its brand name is Sesamet. That has the nausea indication only, so it is not used for loss of appetite associated with weight loss in individuals with HIV. There is pharmaceutical grade cannabidiol or CBD. It is FDA approved as a medication called Epidiolex, which is just extracted and purified CBD actually from the plant. Its indication is for seizures associated with Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. These are uncommon but very severe seizure disorders that usually occur in children where there can be hundreds of seizures in one day. And as you can imagine, if you're having seizures all day, you can't really grow and develop, language gets delayed. So these are very, very severe syndromes, but Epidiolex has been very effective for helping people. It doesn't cure the seizure syndromes, but drastically reduces the number of seizures a child or adolescent will have each day. And then there are the other synthetic cannabinoids. So these are the ones that we often hear about, um, spice and K2, and they have a very interesting history. A chemist named John W. Huffman at Clemson University created many of the synthetic cannabinoid analogs that we know about now in the 1970s. It actually came out of research. They were trying to better understand the cannabinoid receptors in the brain and in the rest of the body. And so he made these chemicals to try to, try to study this. And what they call these chemicals were the JWH series. So using his initials, JWH. Synthetic cannabinoids were also developed by Pfizer in the 1970s. They're called the CP series for Charles Pfizer. And Hebrew University also developed them in the 1980s and they're called the HU series. Challenge was these were all meant for research, but they got out of the lab and it moved into the unregulated illegal synthesis market. And they started to appear in recreational drug markets in the early 2000s. First they were seen in Europe, then they jumped over to the US. And the chemicals that look like CP47, CP497, and JWH108 were identified first in the early recreational samples in the United States. When we speak about synthetic cannabinoids, we often use the names I just mentioned, so synthetic marijuana, K2, spice, and many others. These synthetic cannabinoids mimic the effect of THC, but they are much, much more potent. They're sprayed or coated on plant materials that are then smoked. And the companies that manufacture these put quote unquote, not for human consumption on the packaging to avoid legal consequences. So if you wanted to sue a company that you bought potpourri that said not for human consumption, you knew it had, it had uh, synthetic cannabinoids in it, you wanted to sue the company if something bad happened, they would say, well, gee, we told you not to consume it. We told you not to smoke it. So they avoid legal problems that way. The synthetic cannabinoids are also mixed into liquids, vaped in electronic nicotine delivery devices. They're added to herbal tea or food and consumed. They may be mixed with or sold as other substances. You can get synthetic cannabinoids on the internet, small local stores, gas stations. There's a lot of false advertising that synthetic cannabinoids are safe and natural. And there's lots of colorful packaging and amusing catching names to attract youth. So there's definitely a push to try to get youth to use these, these substances. Many adults do, but again, the marketing is pushed to try to pull in kids. There are hundreds of different types of these synthetic cannabinoids. So you could buy two packages from the same manufacturer and they can have different types of synthetic cannabinoids in variable amounts. There's no control over this. These aren't FDA approved or monitored medications, excuse me, not medication substances. So there's no quality control. 
So in 2011, specific synthetic cannabinoids were made schedule one, controlled substances, and they were the ones that were based on the ones that John W. Huffman and the Pfizer company had made, and there's the list of the names, so JWH-18, 73, and 200, CP-47, 497, and 47497C8. But the challenge is you can make very small changes in the, in the structural chemical compounds and you can convert a schedule one substance into an unscheduled substance. So it, it moves from being illegal to legal. And that's what's happened. And that's why there's so many different types of synthetic cannabinoids and why there's so much out there. So the new approach the FDA has been taking is to try to ban general categories of ingredients. We don't have a lot of data on the long-term effects of synthetic cannabinoids because it's not something we can really study. These are illegal substances, there's no quality control. So not easy to do any kind of laboratory experiment or human experiments. And also that would not be a good idea, that would not be ethical. There's a lot more known about the acute effects, which we'll talk about soon. And there's really not much data on abuse, liability, or addictive properties of synthetic cannabinoids. They are not detected in the urine by standard urine, urine drug screening tests. So that's another problem. People can use them, but we may not know. Switching gears now, we're gonna talk about endocannabinoids and the cannabinoid receptors. So all cannabinoids in, in the plant are similar to neurotransmitters called endocannabinoids. There are two main ones. The first one is N-arachnoidinyl ethanolamine or AE, AEA. It also goes by the name anandamide, which is the Sanskrit word for bliss. The other one is 2-arachnidoinyl glycerol, or 2-AG. So our brains make these chemicals. They're neuro, neuro, neurotransmitters, neurochemicals in our brains. So they are naturally occurring in our body. So these endocannabinoids and the cannabinoids that we've already talked about bind to cannabinoid receptors in the brain and in the body. The cannabinoid receptors go by CB1 and CB2. CB1 receptors are primarily found in the brain. CB2 receptors are found in the immune system, the gastrointestinal system, and the peripheral nervous system. And THC has a high affinity for, C, for CB1 receptors, which are the ones in the brain. CBD has a lower affinity. CB1 receptors, again, are found in brain areas, and they are involved in a variety of different functions, so motor control and planning, which is in a brain area called the basal ganglion, coordination, which is in the cerebellum, memory in the hippocampus, learning, which is also in the hippocampus, reward processing, which is in the ventral striatum, judgment in the prefrontal and frontal cortex, emotional processing in the amygdala, appetite and the hypothalamus and gastric motility, which is in the brain stem. And this is just a picture of the brain. So this is if you took your brain and sort of cut it in half and you're looking at one side of it. And this just represents all the areas in the brain where there are CB1 receptors. As you can see, they are all over the place. As I mentioned, there are a lot of brain areas they are involved in. So wanted to show you a picture of them in addition to going over that list that we just did. And you can see it's movement, sensations, judgment, reward, memory, and coordination. CB2 receptors are found mostly outside the brain. They are in immune system organs and cells, and there are particular white blood cells called lymphocytes and leukocytes. Those are our infection-fighting white blood cells. Your spleen, your tonsils, and another organ called your thymus are very much involved in immune, immune regulation in the body, so CB2 receptors are found in those organs as well. And activating the CB2 receptors causes immune suppression. So it inhibits the migration of immune cells. So those lymphocytes and leukocytes don't move towards areas where there might be injury or, um, or something in the body that's gone wrong where immune cells would go and normally act. And receptor activation also inhibits the production and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines may be a term you've heard in the past two years, because during the COVID infection, it was a very big discussion how the COVID-19 virus really increased the production of cytokines in the body. There was a term that people use called cytokine storm, and that was what 
led to a lot of the lung damage that people had in sort of the first wave of the virus um, when people were initially sick with it. Receptor activation also enhances the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines. So that may reduce inflammation and inflammation induced, induced pain. This may particularly occur in the gastrointestinal system, so your stomach, your intestines, and in your joints. And it may actually help with pain due to nerve damage, which is called neuropathic pain. And activation of CB2 receptors may also decrease immune responses in autoimmune disorders like lupus. So let's get specific about the pharmacology first of THC. So THC most rapidly gets into the body by smoking, vaping, or dabbing. Because if you think about it, when you smoke, the smoke goes into your lungs, gets absorbed right into your blood, straight up to your brain. And then THC, when it's in your brain, is what we call a partial agonist at the CB1 receptor. So partial, what a partial agonist means is that when the THC binds to the receptor in the brain, it activates it, but not completely. And one way to think about it is like a dimmer light switch in your room. So if you had a dimmer light switch in your room, it can be off. It can be completely off, it can be completely on, and then you can, you can vary it in the middle. So a partial agonist is sort of like turning on that switch, that light switch, and having it go maybe about halfway. So you have light in your room, probably enough light to do stuff, but maybe not enough light if you wanted to do certain activities there. So again, THC will activate that, that CB1 receptor, but it won't activate it fully. So it activates it about halfway. Despite the half activation, you still get the psychoactive effects and they occur fairly quickly when you smoke within minutes and they last a few hours. When people orally ingest THC through food products, it slows down the process because in that way, then the, the THC goes into your stomach, gets absorbed into the blood, then it goes by your liver, then it gets back into your blood, and then it goes up to your brain. And the stomach acid and liver will break down some of the THC, so you're not getting as much THC to your brain when you do edibles. And it may take an hour or more to feel the psychoactive effects, because you can see there's several more steps in the process of getting the THC to your brain. The effects, however, last longer, um, but it is also of lower intensity. THC is converted in the liver to 11 nor 9 carboxy THC or THC COOH. And this is the primary urinary marker of cannabis use. So when we do urine drug tests, this is what, what the lab is looking for. THC accumulates in fatty tissues, so that makes it lipophilic, and it's slowly released back into the bloodstream over time. So that makes the detection time of THC quite variable. And it's and other factors influence that as well. So the amount of THC that's used and the potency of the THC. So as we saw on a slide a little, a little while in the past, the THC amounts have gone off, gone up over time. So the higher percentage of THC, the longer you're going to have it in your system. If someone's a regular or an occasional user, so someone who smokes or uses THC products daily will have it in their system much longer than someone who smokes, say, a few times a year. The rate of release back into the bloodstream also has a factor, so that can, that can depend. So if someone's active, they may release more THC stored from their fat stores back into their system at one time than, say, if they're more sedentary. And the range for detecting THC in the urine can be from three days for a single use up to a month or more for chronic use, and again, depending on all those other factors. It's important to remember that a positive urine test for THC only identifies past use. It just means someone's used. It doesn't correlate with impairment, because again, you could have used last week and still be positive today, but that doesn't mean you're impaired and unable to engage in certain activities. Dronabinol, which we mentioned earlier, which is the treatment for nausea related to chemotherapy and anorexia and weight loss related to HIV, will cause a positive THC urine test. THC positive urine tests will not occur with nabilone, which is the other medication we mentioned, epidiolex, because that's pure CBD, that's the seizure medication we spoke about earlier. And as I mentioned before, all the other synthetic cannabinoids, so K2, spice, whatever you want to call it, those synthetic cannabinoids, unless they're mixed in with marijuana, won't come up positive. And it's not the synthetic cannabinoids that would come, positive, come up positive in that case. It's the THC in the marijuana that you're smoking. But again, the K2 and the spice on their own will not come up positive. 
CBD products without THC should not test positive. I'm stressing should not because we're going to talk about some circumstances where we actually have found that CBD products have tested positive. But first, I want to talk about CBD in general. So CBD is, in some ways, is very much like THC. It can be smoked, vaped, dabbed, or orally administered. The onset of action, just like THC, will vary by route of administration, where smoking or vaping or dabbing will be a, a more rapid onset of action as opposed to orally administered CBD. The effects last up to about three hours. And interestingly, high fat meals can increase CBD absorption from edibles. CBD is a CB1 indirect antagonist and a modulator at CB2. So an indirect antagonist, so antagonist means it actually has a blocking effect. So it does not activate the CB1 receptor. And being a modulator of CB2 means it has effects on the receptor itself. Won't get too much into that. But the important part to take away from this is the CB1 indirect antagonist fact antagonist fact. So if, so as we mentioned, THC is a partial CB1 receptor agonist and CB1 is an indirect antagonist. So you may get some balancing out in there. You may offset some of the negative effects of THC with CBD when you smoke marijuana or use a product that has both THC and CBD in it. Interestingly, CBD is a capsation analog. If you've ever heard of capsation, it's actually the active ingredient in chili peppers. It's what makes chili peppers hot. And that has an analgesic effect. Um, capsation is, comes in creams and people use it um, to help control pain. And there may be possible anti-cancer activities with CBD as well. That's, being, that's an area of research. We don't have that, that as a definitive answer yet, but it is something that people are interested in. There also is possible anti-inflammatory effects from the CB2 receptor modulation. CBD is converted by the liver primarily to 7-hydroxy-CBD, 7-OH-CBD, or 7-carboxy-CBD, or 7-CBD-COOH. CBD actually affects liver enzymes that break down certain medications, and it may increase or decrease the blood levels of these medications. One example that they found was Epidiolex, which I've mentioned before, is the seizure medication um, that is pure CBD, was found to increase blood levels of clobazam. Clobazam is a benzodiazepine, so it's in the same family as Valium, Xanax, and Clonopin, and Ativan. Um, but it's only approved to treat lennox gastaut syndrome, which is the severe seizure, seizure syndrome that Epidiolex is also approved for. And what they found in children who were taking Epidiolex and Clobazam is that they had increased sedation. So they were more sleepy, they were hard to wake up when they took both medications. When they stopped one or the other, um, the, the sedation went away. So it wasn't a permanent thing. There may be other medications that CBD affects the metabolism of. We don't know yet. It's not well studied. It may be something we learn over time as CBD products become much more available and used in society. CBD also elevated liver function tests in some children, but there were some children, but there was no evidence of serious liver damage in epidiolex trials. It seemed to be more likely when taking other anti-epileptics or anti-seizure medications that had effects on the liver too. CBD metabolites can be detected in the urine by special testing, but this is just not routinely done. This is only done right now in research studies, and it's not currently tested in workplace or other drug testing programs. There's no sense that that is something that's going to happen anytime soon, but it can be tested for. I just wanted to make that point. Um, because there was sort of this interesting urban, urban legend that went around for a while that perhaps CBD could be converted to THC in the body, and then you would come up THC, THC positive in a urine test. So Wantabi and his colleagues back in 2007 did a laboratory study. So what they did was they took CBD and they put it in a highly acidic artificial gastric fluid. So basically it was like your stomach fluid, but it was in a Petri dish, let's say, and it was very more acidic than your own stomach fluid. And lo and behold, um, CBD got converted to Delta-9-THC or Delta-H-THC and other cannabinoids. 
So again, this was a fake, this was a fake situation, so to speak. It was in a petri dish, and it was not in it was not similar to what actually goes on in our bodies. So in 2021, Scholler and his colleagues did another study, and they did it in humans. And they had 18 individuals who took oral CBD, and then they tested their urine. And they found no delta-9 THC or delta-H THC or any other cannabinoids or metabolites in the urine. So in a real physical setting, so in human bodies, this does not seem to be true. Their conclusion that there is no evidence that CBD is converted to delta-9 THC or delta-H THC in the stomach. Again, this, was, this happened in the lab under artificial conditions, but does not happen in humans. CBD products are not FDA approved other than Epidiolex. And that's actually important because there really is no quality control. There's no oversight of all these CBD products that are out in the world right now. And in 2017, Von Miller and his colleagues did a study. They went online and they bought 84 CBD only marketing products. And they analyzed it for CBD, THC, and other cannabinoids. And what they found is these quote unquote CBD only products had THC in them. 18 of the 84 products had THC. The average amount was 0.47 milligrams per milliliter and the highest amount was six milligrams per milliliter. It's not really clear how these small amounts may affect your urine test or affect people, but it really goes to the point that these were not CBD only, only products and there's really no regulation over them. So there can be other other substances that get in there, particularly THC. And the other thing that they found was the, the only 26 samples had accurate lab labeling of the CBD content. There was mostly under labeling. So they said it had 20% CBD, it might've had 5%. And in few cases there was over -label labeling of the samples. So it could have said 5%, but it was actually 20. So again, the CBD products are not well, well regulated. So there's a lot of variation out there and you're not, you're not really sure exactly what you're getting. That hopefully will change in time, but this is a concern that people have currently. So what are the effects of cannabis? So if you smoke marijuana and use cannabis, people feel high and euphoric. They have impaired attention and impaired short-term memory, impaired judgment, impaired motor control, cord, excuse me, motor coordination, slowed reaction times, distorted sensory perceptions, conjunctival injection, which is a fancy way of saying red eyes, increased appetite, dry mouth, an elevated heart rate, nausea and vomiting will be quelled. So it's an anti-emetic as we mentioned earlier. And this all primarily, primarily comes from THC. Less common effects usually at higher THC doses are anxiety, fear, panic, and paranoia. Nausea and vomiting can actually occur. So it's a paradoxical effect. So at lower THC concentrations, nausea and vomiting are controlled, but at higher doses, you actually get nausea and vomiting. Dizziness can occur and hallucinations can occur, but that's incredibly rare. There have been reports of it, but it's not a common uh, effect at higher THC doses. The magnitude of any acute sign or symptom depends on the amount and potency of cannabis smoked or consumed, the route of administration and individual characteristics. So if you're somebody new to using cannabis products and you use a high THC product, you may be more likely to get the less common effects. If you're someone who uses regularly and you're more used to it, it's probably less likely to happen, but it still could happen. Cannabis overdose, I have overdose in quotes because there is no such thing as a cannabis overdose. Over, there's no um, fatal syndrome. People do not die from using cannabis directly. So, but it is a highly unpleasant syndrome. People will use the term overdose. So when people have too much cannabis, very high THC percentages in their system, they get anxiety, confusing, tachycardia or a very fast heart rate. You can get chest pain and your blood pressure can go up. This is usually due to excess consumption, particularly of edible products. And that's because of that lag time between consuming an edible and feeling, it, feeling its effects. So people will eat more and more um, edibles. They'll eat one and say, gee, I don't feel anything like I do when I smoke. Let me eat some more. And you can get this syndrome where you're feeling incredibly unwell. Inaccurate product labeling, inconsistent manufacturing standards of cannabis products can also contribute to it. Again, as we discussed before, you might think you're getting a THC product that's 2% THC, but it's actually 10%. 
So what about the synthetic cannabinoids? So this is back to spice and K2 and those other compounds. As we mentioned before, they mimic the effects of THC. So you get all the things that I mentioned earlier. So feeling high, sort of sen sensory perception, impaired judgment, increased appetite, but the effects are more pronounced. THC, again, is a partial agonist of the CB1 receptor, but the synthetic cannabinoids in spice and K2 are full CB1 receptor agonists. So going back to our analogy about the dimmer switch, when it's like turning the dimmer switch to the highest setting. So the, the room is flooded with light, right? So when the synthetic cannabinoids bind to the CB1 receptors, you get full activation. So you get very, very strong and very pronounced um, THC type effects. So again, the full agonists are more potent than the THC. And what they found in some of the compounds that were studied for research, so remember HU, Hebrew University, HU210 is 50 to 100 times more potent than the THC in marijuana. And CP55940 is 45 times more potent. So again, you get a much, much stronger effect from the synthetic cannabinoids. They also have a higher affinity for the CB1 receptor, meaning that they bind more tightly. They seek out those CB1 receptors and really bind on much, much more tightly than THC does. JWH, so John W. Huffman, 18 synthetic cannabinoid, has five times the affinity for CB1. So they really, really get in there and, and bind very tightly to the receptors, which also enhances their potency. And the other issue is there's no CBD in synthetic cannabinoids. It's just synthetic cannabinoids. As we mentioned earlier, the CBD may have some balancing effect um, to THCs, but you don't get those in synthetic cannabinoids. So you get this full, full THC effect. With synthetic cannabinoids, in addition to getting THC effects, more severe reactions can cause agitation, anxiety, psychotic symptoms like hallucinations, elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, nausea and vomiting, seizures, kidney injury, and even death. So what are the long-term effects of cannabis on the brain? So our brains are in, undergo active development prenatally from in the womb until about age 21, maybe a little bit longer. So developing brains are much more sensitive than mature brains to environmental influences like substances. And what studies have found is that adults who smoked cannabis regularly during adolescence had impaired connections between neurons in specific brain areas. And these brain areas are the precuneus, which functions, excuse me, it controls functions that require a high degree of integration. So being alert or sort of our self-consciousness, the fimbria, which is an area of the hippocampus involved in learning and memory, the prefrontal areas involved in executive functioning, the subcortical networks that process habits and routines. And the imaging studies showed this. So what they show in these imaging studies are these abnormalities. And what you see on the arm in, in, when you do brain scans is that there's decreased activity in the prefrontal areas that, again, are executive functioning. And, the re, and there's reduced volumes in the hippocampus, which is the area involved with learning and memory. So again, just wanted to show you our brain picture again. So there were, so this area of the brain with memory would shrink and there was also decreased activity in this frontal area of the brain that um, is involved in executive functioning. So our reasoning or judgment, um, things like how we know how to balance a checkbook. <laughs> um, so this, these areas are negatively affected again in adults who used um, cannabis regularly and heavily during adolescence. So what are the long-term effects that come out of this? So these consequences of impaired connections lead to difficulty with attention and memory problems, particularly with encoding, which is how information coming from sensory input in the world is changed into a form that then gets stored in the brain. Consolidation, which is the narrowing down process through which short-term memory is converted into long-term memory and retrieval. So how do we bring back our memories uh, up again after we have formed them and consolidated them? So this can lead to difficulty with complex tasks such as problem solving, mental flexibility, so sort of shifting from thinking about certain things to thinking about other things, and integrating inter information. So taking in information from different sources and putting it all together in a way that our brains can understand. 
Studies of youth can studies of youth cannabis use and psychosocial outcomes have found that youth who use cannabis heavily may have lower educational attainment and an increased likelihood of dropping out of school, lower life satisfaction and achievement on subjective and objective measures. So their sense of their um, achievement and also doing tests. But we always wanna be careful because we can we say this is absolutely causal. So does this absolutely mean that every youth who can uses cannabis will have all of these outcomes? It definitely affects it, but there's other familial and environmental confounders. So things that also affect lower educational attainment and lower life satisfaction and achievement, just like genetic influences, lower socioeconomic status for, for the individuals who were um, examined in these studies, childhood maltreatment and abuse, other substance use and co-occurring psychiatric conditions. So the using cannabis as you in your youth will definitely have an impact on this, but it's hard to say that it's absolutely causal, again, because of all these other potential influences. One thing we do know that can happen when you use cannabis regularly is cannabis use disorder, which is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the fifth edition or the DSM-5. And what cannabis use disorder is a problematic pattern of cannabis use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifest by at least two of the following occurring within a 12 month period. Cannabis is taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than was intended. There's a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control cannabis use. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain cannabis, use cannabis, or recover from its effects. Craving or a strong desire or urge to use cannabis. Recurrent cannabis use resulting in failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. Continued cannabis use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or caused by or exacerbated or worsened by the effects of cannabis. Important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of cannabis use. Recurrent cannabis use in situations in which it is physically hazardous, like driving. Cannabis use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated or worsened by cannabis. Tolerance is defined by a need for a markedly increased amount of cannabis to achieve intoxication or desired effect, markedly diminished effect with continued use of the same amounts of cannabis, and withdrawal is manifest by either of the following, so a withdrawal syndrome from cannabis or cannabis cannabis or a closely related substances taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. There are specifiers, just like there are for all use disorders in the DSM. So mild means two to three symptoms, moderate means four to five, and severe means six or more. There is a concern for adolescents about developing cannabis use disorder. In 2011, Dr. Nora Vokal and her colleagues looked at data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health from the period of 2015 to 2018. And what they wanted to see was the prevalence of substance use disorders by time since first use. And they broke it down into categories. So they had the category of adolescents who were aged between 12 and 17, young adults who were aged 18 to 25, and what they found was 12 months after their first use, cannabis use disorder was higher among adolescents than young adults. So if you started smoking during that age range as an adolescent between 12 to 17, 12 months later, 10, almost 11% of the adolescents met criteria for cannabis use disorder versus about six and a half percent of the young adults. And when they looked 36 months or three years after the first use, 20% of the adolescents met criteria for cannabis use disorder versus about 11%. So the, the conclusion from that study is that adolescents seem to be quite vulnerable to developing cannabis use disorder. And this is really because THC um, increases dopamine release in animals and humans. So Dopamine is a chemical many people may have heard of, and it's a key chemical, and the release of dopamine is a key biological process in the development of all addictions. 
Dopamine release is associated with positive reinforcement of the rewarding effects of any substance. So what happens is, so you use THC, dopamine gets released, and then THC is afforded what we call an exaggerated salience by the brain. And salience is just a stimulus or an aspect of a stimulus that stands out. So your brain goes, wow, this is a good thing. And it likes it and it wants more. But as you use THC and you continue to use it over time, you have a decrease in the number of CB1 receptors in the brain. So the brain pulls back all those receptors that get activated when you use. And over time, you don't get as much uh, dopamine release in the reward centers. So that's where the tolerance comes from. So you need more and more to get the same effect. And you, again, are using more to get the same effect um, or don't get the same effect with using less. And when people stop, the other thing that is associated with um, cannabis use disorder, as we mentioned, can be cannabis withdrawal. This is also a DSM-5 diagnosis, and what it means is cessation of heavy and prolonged cannabis use, which means usually daily or almost daily use during a period of at least a few months. And you can have three or more of the following that develop within approximately one week after stopping cannabis use. Irritability, anger, or aggression, nervousness or anxiety, difficulty sleeping, which can be insomnia or disturbing dreams or other sleep problems, decreased appetite or weight loss, restlessness, depressed mood, and at least one of the following physical symptoms causing significant discomfort, abdominal pain, shakiness or tremors, sweating, fever, chills, or headaches. These signs and symptoms, so the withdrawal should cause you to have clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And the signs and symptoms should not be attributable to a medical condition or are not better explained by another mental disorder, including intoxication or withdrawal from another substance. Cannabis has been shown to have associations with psychiatric disorders. And the one where the most study has been done is psychotic disorders. I just have one slide on this, but there are a lot of studies that have shown this. Again, multiple studies have shown a relationship between cannabis use and the development of psychosis. When you look at the studies altogether, adolescent cannabis use increases the risk of, of psychosis by about 1.7 about 1.7 times. So if you're an adolescent who's used canna cannabis, you are at an increased risk for developing psychosis or a psychotic illness compared to your peers who do not use cannabis. But there's also other specific factors that go along with that and with the cannabis use. So the earlier age of initiation, so if you start smoking cannabis at less than 15 years old, that seems to increase this risk of psychosis higher potency. So when we're looking at those 14, 15, 16 and higher, 90% THC content also plays a role. Frequency of use plays a role. So daily use versus less frequent use and genetic factors. What they found um, is that some adolescents with genetic variants associated with dopamine who smoked marijuana were at increased risk compared to those without this variant. So again, something about our genes may influence this as well. So there is an increased risk, but want to be clear that there are things that influence that increased risk as we just reviewed. What about other psychiatric disorders? <clears throat> In 2020, a study by Deborah Hassan and her colleagues was published, and they looked at um, data from the NISARC, um, which were large epidemiologic studies of adults. And what they found is that cannabis use disorder increased lifetime risks for many, many other psychiatric disorders, so major depression. So if you had cannabis use disorder, you were 2.6 times more likely to have major depression than people without cannabis use disorder. Bipolar disorder, about 3.8%, panic disorder, 3.2%, generalized anxiety disorder, 3.2%, PTSD, 3.8%, alcohol use disorder, quite high at 7.8%, other drug use disorder at, at 10 and nicotine use disorder about 6.6 .6 times likely. But again, one, I'll take this with a grain of salt because it's not entirely clear. The evidence is mixed regarding 
the role of cannabis in causing these disorders, the course and prognosis of these psychiatric conditions. And it also the questions come up, which came first? Are you depressed because you're using cannabis or are you using cannabis because you're depressed? So a, lot's, a lot that still needs to be elucidated, but these are striking numbers so that, that there is this association between cannabis use disorder and psychiatric conditions. There have been studies also looking at cannabis and suicide. This was a study of adolescents. So when they do studies of substances and suicide, they often lump them together. So tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis use have been associated with suicide attempts in adolescents in several studies. But again, they tend to get lumped in with other substances. So cannabis gets lumped in with illicit substances, which includes cocaine and heroin and many others. So in 2020, Khan and his colleagues did a study of particularly of marijuana and suicide. And they looked at the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey or the YRBS data from 2011 to 2017. And they found that marijuana use was more strongly associated with suicide attempts than suicidal ideation in the prior 30 days. So more frequent use of marijuana, 20 days or more had the highest prevalence ratio for suicide attempts. So you were more likely to have a suicide attempt the more you smoked um, compared to ideation. So ideation was a bit less. And these were comparable to alcohol and tobacco in, risk, in terms of risk of suicide. But again, want to be careful, there's no evidence of a causal effect. So this is just a study that shows, okay, Adolescents who use a lot of marijuana had this risk of suicide. It's not clear what the relationship is between the substance use and suicide. And there are those confounding factors, as we mentioned earlier. So let's switch now and talk about the physical effects. Cannabis has been shown to have effects on the lungs, and they've been assumed to be similar to smoked tobacco because cannabis and tobacco smoke contain a lot of the same compounds. There's volatile organic and particulate compounds when you smoke. And the most serious complications of tobacco use disorder that we know are COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and cancer. The evidence that cannabis causes these disorders is actually quite limited. There does seem to be some evidence from a lot of studies that using tobacco regularly and smoking cannabis regularly likely, likely increases the risk for COPD, but there's no evidence that cannabis use alone increases COPD risk. The results of epidemiologic studies of cancer and cannabis use are mixed. There may be an increased risk with very heavy use, so like 10 joints per day or more for many, many years. But again, a lot of these studies, the individuals also, st also smoke tobacco, so it's a bit confounded. Is it the tobacco or is it the cannabis? It's not really clear. Probably the better evidence for effects on the lungs are that smoking cannabis causes chronic bronchitis. I highlighted that because that seems to be the best evidence. Other things that may occur, inflammation of the large airways, increased airway resistance, lung hyperinflation, increased rates of general respiratory infections, so more colds and flus, and increased rates of pneumonia. There have been very rare reports of what they call marijuana lung, or the medical term being giant bullous emphysema. And what giant bullous emphysema is a large cavity of air, usually in the upper lobes of the lungs. So it's sort of like a balloon that develops in your lungs. And if that ruptures, your lung can actually collapse, a condition called pneumothorax. There's only been case reports. It's the causality is not clear, but it is not something that is seen commonly. So there's probably an association, but it needs to be understood more. What the greater concern is about vaping cannabis liquids through specialized electronic products or through modified electronic cigarettes. So multiple surveys have found that electronic delivery systems to inhale cannabis is more common among adolescents, so 12 to 18 year olds. And what they found with cannabis e-liquids, the liquids that you put into the electronic devices is that they, can be, they do contain the cannabis extracts, but they also contain a lot of dilutants. Vitamin E acetate, medium chain triglycerides, so basically some fatty compounds, coconut oil, which also has a lot of fat, fat and propylene glycol and or vegetable glycerin, again, which is also fatty. <coughs> what has come out of that is a concern about a condition called e-cigarette vaping product use associated lung injury or e-valley. In a study out of the University of Texas, they 2,807 hospitalizations were examined 
for Evali, and there were 68 deaths between February 2019 and February 2020. The median age of those who died was 24, and nearly 75% were male. And out of 2,022 hospitalized for whom substance use data was available, so they looked at all these hospitalizations, but not all, not all of them had data, 82% um, of the individuals hospitalized with Evali had used THC containing products, 33% used THC only containing products, 57% used nicotine containing products, and 13% used nicotine only containing products. So there's different things there. There was some nicotine there, some THC there, um, but those were the, the main two substances that people were vaping. It's believed that the vitamin E acetate that we mentioned earlier was strongly implicated as the cause of Evali because it's fatty, it gets in the lungs, you get um, an inflammatory response, and um, it does not seem that the other chemicals are likely involved. Nicotine e-liquids don't contain the vitamin E acetate, and that's why it's become such a strong um, contender for this syndrome. In terms of the cardiovascular system, smoking cannabis has been shown to increase heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac oxygen demand, blood carboxyhemoglobin, um, which is a compound that comes up, um, hemoglobin is important for um, delivering oxygen. So this does not, this a carboxyhemoglobin blocks the delivery of oxygen, and it also causes damage to the lining of blood vessels. It's not entirely clear how this all plays out. There was a review in 2020 by Latif and Garg, and there may be a link between smoking cannabis and myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, particularly among young adults where that's less common, blood clot formation, and cardiac arrhythmias. Again, this evidence is not as strong. We need more study, but there is some concerns there as well. Probably the most interesting thing that comes about from cannabis use and medical conditions is something called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome or CHS. This is episodic, severe, and persistent nausea and vomiting associated with prolonged excessive cannabis use and may occur for days or months. Those who have CHS usually present to the ED because they can't stop vomiting, they feel sick all the time. And the signs and symptoms that they present with include dehydration, acute kidney injury, electrolyte imbalances that may be severe, and a possible a tear in their esophagus from so much severe and persistent vomiting. The symptoms are relieved when cannabis use stops. And another interesting thing that comes along with this is the compulsive use of hot showers to relieve syndromes. Symptoms, excuse me. This is a learned trait. Not sure why people figured this out, but they take hot showers and they do feel better. And some people have kind of jokingly called this cannabis shower syndrome. We don't really understand why cannabis hyperemesis syndrome happens. It may be more likely to occur with high potency cannabis because again, those high levels of THC, as we mentioned earlier, may actually induce nausea and vomiting. The treatment is just symptom management, rehydration, restoring electrolyte imbalances. You can give people anti-nausea agents, but they may not always be effective. And the real treatment is you have to stop smoking cannabis. And in this last section, I just want to review some issues regarding cannabis and pregnancy. In 2019, Chang and her colleagues published an observational study where they interviewed women who reported cannabis use during pregnancy. What they said is they use cannabis to treat nausea and vomiting, increase their appetite, and relieve stress. And these findings have been reported in many other studies. Um, and the view is by these women that cannabis is natural and therefore it's safe and harmless. Um, they felt prescribed medications were chemicals more unnatural and not something they wanted to put in their body when they were pregnant. It's they were unclear about the risks of cannabis to the developing fetus, and they actually felt frustrated about the lack of information available to them, where they felt with tobacco, there was plenty of information available, and they would be more likely to avoid tobacco products rather than cannabis products for that reason. What we do know is that THC crosses the placenta and can be found in breast milk. Some studies have linked prenatal cannabis use to low or lower birth rate and small for gestational age. And again, I highlighted those because those seem to be the most um, likely outcomes um, to a developing fetus. So low birth weight and small for gestational age means the fetus or the infant is smaller or less developed than normal for the baby sex and gestational age. 
and it's often defined as lower than the 10th percentile. Other concerns that may come about with cannabis use in pregnancy is preterm labor, decreased body length of the baby, smaller head circumference, increased stillbirths, and increased risk of neonatal intensive care unit admissions. Other studies have not shown these associations, so it's still kind of up in the air. We have a lot more to learn. And the inconsistent findings may be due to a number of factors, different study designs, some were chart reviews, some were studies where they followed women during the pregnancy or prospective studies, cannabis legalization in states where the studies took place. So if, if the study was in a state where it was illegal, the women may have underreported their use and there was inconsistent use of control variables. So things like birth, birth parent age can affect all those negative outcomes. Other substance use, particularly tobacco, the frequency of cannabis use, the amounts used, and the potency. What do we tell women in pregnancy? So the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2017, and then last year in 2021, confirmed these recommendations for pregnancy. So before pregnancy and in early pregnancy, all women should be asked about their use of tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs, including marijuana and other medications used for non-medical reasons. Women reporting marijuana use should be counseled about concerns regarding potential adverse health consequences of continued use during pregnancy. Women who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy should be encouraged to discontinue marijuana use. Pregnant women or women contemplating pregnancy should be encouraged to discontinue use of marijuana for medicinal purposes in favor of an alternative therapy for which there are better pregnancy specific safety data. And there are insufficient data to evaluate the effects of marijuana use on infants during lactation and breastfeeding. And in the absence of such data, marijuana use is discouraged. So in conclusion, cannabis is a complex plant that produces multiple compounds with THC and CBD being of most interest. Cannabis use has been associated with a number of health effects, but causality has been difficult to determine. The better evidence exists for problems with attention, memory, and learning, the development of cannabis use disorder and cannab can cannabis withdrawal, psychosis in vulnerable populations, e-volley with the use of unregulated cannabis e-liquids, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, and low or lower birth weight and small for gestational age babies in when women use cannabis during pregnancy. And this is me, and I want to thank you one more time for listening to our Learning Thursday and for attending today. I want to thank Dr. Hennessy for today's program. I hope you will all find it useful while assisting clients in need of services. Your feedback is important to us. It helps us to know if we're meeting your educational goals and expectations. Once you have viewed the presentation in its entirety and completed the quiz, please follow directions to access the SurveyMonkey website and take a moment to complete the evaluation, including suggesting any further topics for Learning Thursdays. Once again, thank you for joining us and keep up the good work.